Cavalry to the crimson flow Many arrows pierce my soul from without within But my Lord leads me on through him I must win Number 94 Oh, I want to see him look upon his face There to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past home at last ever to rejoice. When in service for my Lord, dark may be the night. But I'll cling more close to him, he will give me light. Satan's snares may vex my soul, turn my thoughts aside. But my Lord goes ahead, leads whate'er betide. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. When in valleys low I look toward the mountain high And behold my Savior there leading in the fight With a tender hand outstretched toward the valley low Guiding me I can see as I onward go Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home at last ever to rejoice when before me billows rise from the mighty deep then my lord directs my bark he does safely keep and he leads me gently on through this world below he's a real friend to me oh i love him so oh i want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Amen. That's some good singing. We'll go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Brother James, would you open us up in prayer this morning? Amen. You can be seated. A few announcements. Don't forget, so many times at regular times. But uh, the week of Thanksgiving, we're going to move the service up to Tuesday. Uh, that way, if anybody's traveling for Thanksgiving, you can still make it for service. It'll be a little bit of a different service. Uh, that Tuesday, we're going to have, uh, we did it last year, so those of you who are here will remember, uh, we'll do a service where uh, we give testimony, praises about how good God's been to us, and then have your favorite hymn picked out with that. And uh, we'll, we'll, sing, we'll sing a verse of your favorite hymn and uh, go through that. And if you guys take the whole time praising the Lord, then you know what? We won't have any preaching afterwards. But if you, if you don't, if you finish early, I'm going to get to preach to you a little bit. No, I'm just playing with you. But then after, right immediately following that, we'll have a pie fellowship. Uh, so if you bring a pie that you enjoy, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get together, eat some pie, have a good time. Just a time of fellowship. Uh, just thanking the Lord for our church. I'm so thankful for a good church that we have. I'm thankful for how the Lord has been blessing our church and uh, thankful for what he's, what he's been doing. I assume about last week we had 11 first-time visitors over the, the course of that day. And so what a blessing that is and what a blessing it is that the Lord allows that to, to happen. And, uh, but, uh, but just you know, thankful for the church that we have, thankful for the church family we have. Uh, not every church is blessed with a, with a family as a church. Uh, but I'm thankful that ours is. So we'll go ahead and do that. But we'll get around. Shake some hands after the, the first verse and chorus of our second song. Um, I'll let Brother John come up. I don't remember. I think it's the 12th today. Uh, so it'll be song number 50. There is power in the blood. Song 50. If you want to go ahead and stand to your feet. Song number 50. After the first verse and chorus, we'll get around shake hands. Tell people we're glad to see him. Brother John. Oh, 
Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. On the second, number 50, would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. 
the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Time for offering. Uh, Brother Doug and Brother Brendan, can I have you all come take offering this morning? You can be seated. Let me encourage you. Be faithful to the Lord as he's been faithful to you. I'm so glad that we serve a faithful God. So glad we serve a faithful God. And, and uh, think about all the ways he's been faithful to me in my life. Uh, he's not just been faithful monetarily, but in every area of my life, he's been faithful. You know, there's never been a time God's let me down, and there's never going to be a time God lets you down either. And uh, so I'm encouraged to be faithful to him. Brother Brendan, would you pray for the offering this morning? Let's go to number 62. Number 62, Calvary covers it all. Number 62. Let's stand. Number 62.
scripture this morning will come from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21. And that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21. Hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Father, we thank you this morning for letting us gather here in your house on this Lord's Day. Father, we thank you for how you have kept us all week long. And Lord, we ask that you would just please allow us to see the beauty of this moment. Lord, I know we have preaching three times a week, but let us not take for granted this sacred time, this very special time, that it can change us, it can change our hearts, it can change our lives. Those who might be lost, those who might not know you, those who may not believe that they can hear this preach word today and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray.
I've ever done. God loved me enough to save me. And in spite of the fact that I don't deserve it, he still loved me. He still was willing to pay the price. And uh, when he saved me, I didn't, I didn't just stay the way I was and change me. He gave me the power to become one of the sons of God. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for all that he's ever done for me. First Peter chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 21. Uh, we read that already, but we'll look at it here again. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 21. The Bible says there, it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should or that ye should follow in his steps. Uh, the Bible's full of examples as we look at Scripture. The Bible's full of examples of people taking steps forward for Christ and people taking steps backward for Christ. We call it backsliding. People, people moving in the direction they ought to go and people going in the direction they ought not to go. And today, uh, we're going to look at these, these different groups of people. We're actually going to be looking at the children of Israel and then David himself. And we're going to be looking and comparing... Uh, um, these, these two groups of people, these two the, this group of people and an individual, and some practical things that the Lord showed me on the subject of just one more step. Uh, sometimes in our life, if we're not careful, uh, we get so consumed looking a year down the road that we take missteps today. We get so busy looking about where we want our life to end up, and so consumed in the end of, that we forget to take the next step in faith that God would have us to take. Many times we get caught up in, in the things of this world, and, and surely the, the people we're going to look at today are no different. We look at the children of Israel, uh, and throughout the book of Numbers chapter 13 through Numbers chapter 20, uh, we see that in Numbers 13, uh, that spies were sent to go look at the promised land. They were sent to go look at this land that God had told them would be their land, and we see here the beginning of their detriment. Surely you want to know the enemy's strength. But what happened, this was not a mission to figure out how to attack the enemy. This was a mission to find out if they should attack the enemy. This land that God had already promised them. And we know the song, 12 that went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good, right? The 10, 10 spies came back and had an evil report. And in chapter 14 we find that. And the children of Israel decided, hey, we're not going to go into the promised land. The enemies of God are too strong. The enemies of Israel are too strong. There are giants in the land. There are big walled cities. We, we don't think we can take this. And in chapter 14, they realized when God told them that, they would, that none of them would enter the promised land, they realized the error of their way. And they said, you know what? Now we're going to go claim the promised land. And Moses told them, said, God's not with you. Don't do that. And they went up to go, to, go to battle, and they lost. They, they were defeated. They were smitten by their enemies. You know, sometimes in our life, we can't fix uh, the consequence of the situation we messed up. Sometimes you make a mistake, sometimes you make a decision, and there are consequences that you can't escape as a result of that. Uh, but we see here uh, that the punishment for their rebellion uh, and it was that they would have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and everyone over the age of 20 would die, with the exception of the two spies, of course. And you see, they were brought, uh, the, the children of Israel, they were brought to the edge of the promised land. They were brought to the very cusp of God's will. Uh, they, are, they, they, uh, they saw the grapes of Eshcol. They saw all that it had to offer. The, milk, the land of milk and honey. They, they saw the rewards and the benefits. But they missed out on God's will. They missed out on the perfection of God's will. Simply because they refused to take the next step of faith. They refused to take the next step and follow God into the promised land. But before we're too quick to rail on the children of Israel for their unbelief, many times I find that we are the same way. We get brought to the cusp of God's will, the cusp of what God would want us to be, where God would want us to, 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 to be, what he wants us to do, to, make, to be a successful Christian. But we stop just a fragment too short. We stop one step early, maybe because of fear, worry, doubt, anger, Bitterness, sin, rebellion. You can pick any one of those lists, and I can name you people I've known that have, have missed short of God's will. Not because they couldn't do it, but they, they just didn't take the right step. They didn't make the next step. All of these things can lead to us missing out on the perfect will of God for our lives. Things that can prevent us from success in our Christian life. Now, we must understand there are many more things in the list of seven things that I just said. 
There are many more things that can keep us from missing God's will for our life. But one thing that I'd like to see uh, before we actually get into all of the lesson is that this was already a well-established pattern for the children of Israel. If you look throughout the Bible, you can see a pattern of the children of Israel. Uh, uh, they would stray away from God, then they would return, then they would return, then they would return after correction or imprisonment or return after defeat. It was a cycle for the children of Israel. And one, we must be guarded that we don't have a cycle. I know many people uh, that this is the way their life looks as well. They do well for a while, then they stray, then, then they receive God's hand of blessing because they're doing the things that they're supposed to do. And then they be, when they begin to receive God's blessing, they think that they can stop doing the things that they're supposed to do. And then God's correction comes, they lose his hand of blessing, and they say, man, I've got to get back to God. Then they become faithful again. Then they begin to get blessed again, and then they fall off the wheel, or, or they fall off the wagon again. And it's this never-ending cycle. As Christians, we do not have to fall into that cycle. Amen. We do not have to fall into that trap. It is possible to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. It is possible to live a life of a successful Christian life. We see the story of David, and uh, we could we could really do a lot of a lot of lessons just on David himself, a man after God's own heart. I believe there were there are a lot of good lessons we could take uh, from someone that was a man after God's own heart. But we see that David started as a shepherd, that he was anointed to be king, that he uh, he played the heart for King Saul when he had bad spirits. Upon him. Then he killed Goliath, and Saul began to love him, and so much he gave him his own daughter to marry. He became hated by Saul over a song. I'm sure you remember the story. Uh, as they were marching back into the city, the song, the ladies of the city began to sing, Surely Saul has killed his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Mm -hmm. And Saul became angry and bitter. We know that uh, Saul tried to kill David, threw javelins at him. And David ran into hiding, even though he had done nothing wrong. David was given an opportunity to kill Saul, not just once, but twice. He had opportunity to slay the one that was trying to kill him. But he did not. He said, I won't touch God's anointed. He said, I'm going to stay away. He said, I, I will not do this thing. I know what God has told me would be his will, but I am not going to pursue it. I will not bring it about when he is ready. Wouldn't it be God that we as Christians would do that? We may know what God's will is. I knew, I knew uh, from a young age that God would have me to, to preach in some capacity. I knew he would have me be in the ministry. You know, but as a, as a, as a young man, it probably wasn't the best thing for me to go try and pastor a church. Uh, I, I would, certainly wasn't qualified to pastor a church according to biblical qualifications. I had to go through some training. I had to go through some understanding. I had to go through some learning. I, I had to receive things that I did not yet have. We may know what God's will is, but there will require steps to get to where God has for you to be. Amen. You don't just wake up and all of a sudden you're in God's will. In David's life, it was the same way. He didn't just wake up and all of a sudden he was king of Israel. He stayed in God's will. He stayed faithful where he was at and continued taking steps toward the Lord. And the more he took steps toward the Lord, the closer the Lord got to him. And soon he found himself in God, and, and, and soon he found himself where God had promised that he would be. Saul still sought David's life, even after David spared him twice. His family was taken in a raid. You remember that? He and his band of mighty men, yeah, their families were taken in a raid, and the men began to speak of stoning David. Uh, they went back and they retrieved the family, they retrieved their families, saved their families. And then uh, Saul and Jonathan and all of Saul's children went to battle against the Philistines, and they were all killed in the same battle. David was then made king of Israel, and David's reign, reign began. Amen. I think just thinking about this list, we could probably agree that David went through a lot. Would you agree with that? Amen. That David went through a lot of trials in his life before finding himself king of Israel? If anyone had a right to be angry, I would think it would be David. This king, this man that he was loyal to, every time Saul called him back and said, I won't kill you, I want to bring you back, you know what David did? He went back. And he served the king. He was loyal. He was faithful. No one would have thought less of David had he killed King Saul in that game. How do I know? Because all of his followers said, we already know you're anointed. Just slay him and become the king. 
after all he's done. You know, people, uh, people could see the, the, the effects happening to King Saul. I don't think it was a hidden thing that Saul was, uh, was, was beginning to fail as king. Right? The, the sin that he made with, in, front of the, in front of the people of the Amalekites, that was a very public thing. Samuel did not say quietly that you have been revoked as king of Israel. But you know what? David just stayed true to the things that he was supposed to do. All the odds were against David, yet he stayed true and continued fast. Some days I think that David woke up thinking, I don't know if I can make it through today. I think if we're all honest, we've had days before where we woke up and said, man, I, I don't think I can make it today. Amen. I think today's a little rough. I think today's difficult. I think, there, I think I'm, I'm struggling too much. Can I just go back to bed and sleep till tomorrow? The, 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 str the struggle is real. I, I cannot make it. Sometimes we think, I can't make it through this year. And in the times where we begin to think, I can't make it through the year, we ought to think to ourselves, I just got to make it through the month. If you say, well, I can't even make it through the month, just, I'll make it through the week. I can't make it through the week, make it through the day. I can't make it through the day, make it through the hour. Pastor, I can't make it through the hour, make it through the minute. As slow as we have to break it down, break it down. But do not stop progressing for Jesus Christ. Amen. Can I say, uh, sometimes God withholds the big picture from us because he's not ready for us to see it yet. The Bible says it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. A lamp. I, have you ever seen before? Uh, there was a guy in college. It was one of the Lake brothers. They, they bought this huge flashlight. Brother Mike, remember that flashlight? He, you could see, uh, it was like the highest lumens possible. He spent a ridiculous amount of money on it. I don't know why he needed it, but for whatever reason, he wanted to buy it. And that thing would light up over a mile down the road. You could see that light for, and it was so bright. <laughs> but you know what a lamp is? A lamp isn't that. A lamp, as you walk, it shows you enough to take the next step. It shows you enough to make sure that you don't fall from your way. But it doesn't show you the mile of the road. Sometimes God's will isn't for you to know where you're going to end up. It's just enough for you to take the next step. Amen. There have been things in my life, had I known I was going to face them, I would have done things differently. Mm -hmm. But God's, God's will was for me to go through those things. Mm -hmm. You might say, Pastor Barney, you don't know the kind of situation I'm in. And you're right, I don't. Even if I was in the same position as you, I would handle the situation differently. Because I'm not you. We're all different people. Mm -hmm. But I do want, I do know what it's like to be in a dark valley. I do know what it's like to watch your daughter's life being extinguished in front of you. I know what it's like to watch nurses perform CPR on a two-pound baby trying to keep her alive. I do know what it's like to listen to doctors say, I can't get her life support tube in, her breathing tube. Her airways are too small. I know what it's like for, for your child not to wake up from anesthesia and to begin to flatline. I don't say it for pity. I say it so you understand we all have values. We all have darkness that we face. We all have hard times. I know what it's like to be able to look at your baby and not be able to touch them. I know what it's like to not see the light at the end of the tunnel. I remember that first night when I was in the NICU. If any of you have ever had kids in the NICU, I remember that first night. I sat there, and there was no light for me. In, in the small baby, so there's, there's, there's NICU, which is the neonatal intensive care unit. But then within NICU, there's the small babies unit within NICU. And in that unit, the lights never come on. It's always dark in that room because they're trying to preserve the child's eyes. Their eyes aren't ready for all that light and exposure yet. They have little lamps that you can turn on and do different things, but, but you know what? It's dark. And I remember sitting there that first day and that first night and the second day, and I felt in darkness. There was no light. I didn't know if my kids were going to make it. They began talking about brain bleeds and, and all of these other things and, and all of these difficulties. And they told me there's going to be two steps back for every one step forward. I was in darkness. I was in the valley. And, you know, I couldn't see my way out of the valley. But the lamp of God's word allowed me to see enough to take the next step. Amen. And you know what? One step turned into two, and two stepped into three. And friend, I wasn't looking all the way down the road. I was looking at an hour from now. 
I was looking at two hours from now, three hours from now. Many times I would, I would tell people and people would maintain a Facebook thing for my kids so people would know how to pray. Many times I was looking six hours down the road because they said, we're going to have to do surgery if something doesn't change. And you know, God saw us through that. And then 12 hours from now, there's going to have to be a surgery if this doesn't change. We're going to have to go in and figure out why your daughter's lungs aren't developing correctly. We have to figure out why your son is having blockages in his intestines. We're, we have to do this. We have to do that. And God's people would begin to pray. It, and God would see us through that time. In darkness, you don't see the end of the way. You learn to walk by faith. Amen. But many times, I say many times, that may not be an accurate statement. Sometimes... We as Christians say, it's dark, I can't see everything, so I'm not going to walk at all. Mm -hmm. That's not what God's called us to do. Because, you know, it doesn't matter how dark the night is, because we have the light of God's word to guide us. Amen. Your situation may be dark, and I, I, I certainly am not trying to tell you that your situation is not real, or your situation is not difficult, or your situation is not hard. But what I'm trying to tell you today, friend, is the light of God's word is guide us through any dark situation. I think Psalms chapter 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Nothing that you can ever go through will have the absent of God's presence. Amen. God's in the valley of the shadow of death. God's on the mountain of prosperity. God's in the valley of financial trouble. God is anywhere that you are. And he can help you if you'll rely on his word, and if you'll trust him enough to take the next step. This evening, or this morning, what I'd like to do is go, and we'll look at a few differences between the children of Israel and David, and how we ought to guide our life, how we ought to govern our life, the steps we ought to take in our life to help us be what we ought to be, even in darkness. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I sure love you, and I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this opportunity you've allowed us to come before you in prayer. God, I pray that you use this message, Lord. Let it bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, I pray that you'd help our church, Lord, to stay faithful to you, continue to take steps towards you. Lord, I love you. Come in my prayer. Amen. Now, the first thing that I want you to see uh, in, in the correlation between looking at the Israelites and David is their attitude. And if we look at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, we'll find there uh, this verse here, Philippians 4.11, but I want you to notice that the Israelites' attitude was filled with this contentment. If you were to watch them after they were leaving from Egypt, there were many times where they told Moses, we should just go back to Egypt. It was better for us to be there. You know what that is? Discontentment. God began to provide manna for them. And you know what? That heavenly bread wasn't good enough for them. They said, Moses, we want meat. You know what? They said, They said, Moses, we're going to die of, uh, of thirst here. You've got to do something. You, you know, it was always something else with the children of Moses, or the children of Israel, rather. It was always something else, always some other problem. Well, they complained about crossing the Red Sea, worrying about what they're going to eat, the wrong kind of meat. They complained and complained and complained and complained. Can I tell you, we are not taking steps for God if all we can do is complain. Right. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 11, the Bible says... Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You know what that's saying? Whatever state I'm in, that means if I'm in the valley, I'm going to be content in the valley. If I'm on the mountain, I'm going to be content on the mountain. Whether trial, whether prosperity, whether difficulty, uh, wh 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 whether easy times, whether rough, wh wh whether rough seas or smooth seas, I'm going to be content because God has me there for a reason. I see not only, though, where the children of Israel and their attitude discontent, they were also disobedient. Uh, we, it was very clear that God had called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. But we look at the man named Korah. Korah and his followers, what did they do? They went after God's man. We see that Miriam and Aaron, supposedly Moses' right hand, what did they do? They spoke secretly behind Moses' back, and Miriam became filled with leprosy. They, she had to go to Moses and say, I spoke bad about you. That's why this is happening. Uh, would you pray for me? And Moses prayed, and her, her leprosy was healed. 
And, 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 uh, but, but we see time after time uh, in the children of Israel, not just in their e exit from uh, Egypt, but in so many other areas. Uh, when they were entering the promised land, even after that 40-year hiatus, they were told to drive out everyone, and they did not. They made covenants and leagues with, where they made covenants with some people. They didn't drive everyone out of, uh, of the other areas. Uh, when it came time for them to enter the first time, they chose not to obey God. They were disobedient. Can I say this? We, we must be careful about, firstly, we must be careful about going after people that God puts in authority over us. Amen. Right. Can I tell you, your boss at work, if you believe it's God's will for you to be there, do you know what that also means? It's God's will for the boss to be over you. <coughs> You say, well, he, he doesn't love God. God's used a lot of people that don't love God right. in, in the history of this world. <coughs> because you remember, just because they don't love God doesn't mean God doesn't have power over them. I remember, I seem to recall, uh, after Jesus Christ comes back to this earth the second time, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall profess, even the, even the knees and even the tongues which hated God are going to bow, they're going to confess that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Right. Can I tell you, if you believe that that's where God has you, then the, the bosses that are over you are there for a reason. You ought to be careful about speaking out against them. Amen. Can I tell you, the spiritual authorities that God has placed in your life. I'm not saying this because I'm your pastor. I'm saying this because I don't want God to come after you. That's right. Amen. You look throughout history when, when, the, when, when people go after the men of God that God has put in their life, God does not deal kindly with those people. That's right. Even children. Amen. You remember they said, go up, old thou bald head. They were just making fun of him. Did God think that was very funny? No. No. He sent two she-bears to go kill all the children. Amen. Of course, I, I don't hope that happens to our church, but, but we must understand that, that God takes very seriously you ripping down the authority that God has placed in your life. Yes. Wives, your husbands, you ought to be careful how you speak about your husbands to other people. Uh, husbands, you ought to be careful how you speak about your wife. Your wife may not be an authority to you, but you know those little minions that you have running around your house called children? <laughs> They're an authority to them. Amen. Mm -hmm. You ought to be careful. You tear down your you tear down mama's authority in the home. You're gonna teach your children to rebel. You're gonna teach your children to be disobedient. Right. Disobedience is not something that the Lord tolerates. If we look throughout Scripture, he corrects when disobedience happens. Amen. God's the faithful corrector. You don't get away with anything. He sees it all. I always wondered as a child, how my mom always knew what I was doing. You know the joke that moms have eyes in the back of their head? Sometimes I believe it. I've never checked it, but I'm pretty sure that it, it could be a real thing. Amen. You know what? We have a saying in my home, if it's quiet, Canaan's up to something. <laughs> if it's quiet, bad things are happening. Amen. You know what? But many times we think we get it, we get things over on God. Just because the correction wasn't immediate didn't mean, didn't mean it wasn't that didn't mean it was right. Sometimes God doesn't correct you in that moment. But you know, one day you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, and you're going to give an account for everything you've ever done. That'll be plenty good correction for you. What do you mean? You have to stand before the one who paid the price for all of your sins. And you know it that he paid for your sins. That he, why'd you do that? You know, the people the people in today's society who said, who said, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want. I think they're going to be in for a rude awakening when they stand before Jesus Christ. Amen. Friend, we must understand that disobedience is not tolerated by God. God's long-suffering and wants to see us come back, so sometimes the correction is not immediate. He wants us to come back of our own volition. But sometimes there are still consequences for our decisions. I see that David, David was not a perfect man. It's important that we preface this. David was not perfect. Why is it important we preface it? Because you need to understand you are not perfect. David was a man after God's own heart, yet committed some heinous things. Adultery is heinous. Right. It's heinous. But you know what? God still calls David a man after God's own heart. You can be forgiven for those sins that you've committed. You can be forgiven for those things. But 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 we must understand, church, is, is that David, the reason I, I believe, looking at Scripture, one of the reasons why David was called a man after God's own heart is because he wanted his heart to line exactly with where God wanted him to be. 
He made mistakes. He failed. He did things he shouldn't have done. It's recorded in Scripture. So too have you and I. But you know what we can do? We can do our best to align our mindset, to align our hearts, to align our will with God's. What do I see about David? That he was the exact opposite of a lot of the things we look at. I see that David was a content man. I'm sure that he was not necessarily happy about every situation he has ever placed in. I, I don't think that if he had a preference, he would choose sleeping in a cave. I know I wouldn't. My idea of camping is a holiday in express. Okay? <laughs> That's my idea of camping. I'm not in the tent unless society collapses. You see, Pastor, my intense, you know that's why. Okay? But, 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 friend, we must understand, we must understand that David was content. He knew he would be king. He didn't need to rush God. He knew God was in control, and he just decided to let God's way work itself out. God's way, uh, 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 or God's will, done God's way, will never lack God's supply. It, it'll never lack. I see that he was obedient. He served the king even though he knew the king wanted to kill him. He understood that there was an authority structure in place with his life, and he understood that God placed Saul in that position, and it was not his responsibility to take Saul out of the picture. Maybe God's called you to do something, and there's somebody else doing what you're doing. It's not your job to remove him. If God's called you to do it, he'll make the way in his time. Uh, I think about... I think about uh, specifically with authority today. Uh, I remember there was a time when I was in Bible college. Uh, it was all over the news. A, a police officer was just filling up his car at a gas station. And a man walked up behind him and executed him. There was no reason, no cause. He just walked up behind him and shot the man. You know what? There was no, uh, there was no regard for authority. Because, dis because, because obedience was never taught to this young man. Uh, disobedience is the natural thing that we would default to. i got to tell you, I've never had to teach my children to disobey. Any parents, have you had to teach your children to disobey? Well, they do it naturally. They do it naturally, right? Right? Obedience has to be taught. As parents, it's part of our responsibility to teach okay. obedience. Why? Because if we do not teach obedience, rebellion will become second nature. Amen. Uh, if we teach our children to disobey authority, rest assured, parents, the children will disobey your authority. Right. You say, well, well, I, uh, you say, I have never taught my children to disobey authority. Well, we may never tell them to do this, but, but let me ask, have you ever talked bad about your pastor at the dinner table? Mm -hmm. You're teaching your children to disrespect and disobey authority. Mm -hmm. Husbands, you ever talk bad about their mama? You're teaching your child to disrespect and disobey authority. The teachers of their school, you ever talk bad about their teachers? You're disrespecting and disobeying authority. Now let me say this, is a teacher always right? No. But you know what? You can go out up to bat for your kid without destroying authority in their life. You can go and have that conversation with the teacher or the admins or whoever else has to, ha has to have that conversation without destroying authority. Can I say, uh, we must understand that we do not have to tell them to disobey authority. It's already in them. We need to teach them to obey authority. Amen. Even if we look later at the life of David, we see the sin of David and Bathsheba. We talked about this already. David was not perfect. David messed up like you and I, but David was tender enough to admit when he made a mistake, admit that he did wrong, and make it right with God. You see, David's prayer was not, Lord, cover up my sin. David's prayer was renew a right spirit within him. Yeah. He knew his spirit was wrong. He knew his attitude was wrong. He knew those things were wrong, and he wanted to be renewed. Amen. I tell you, maybe, maybe you're not where you want to be with God today. Your prayer should be, God, renew the right spirit. God, help me get back to where I ought to be. Lord, help me begin to be transformed through you once again. Amen. But I see not just their attitude, church. I also see their actions. I also see their actions. That The Israelites were defiant. Many times throughout the history of the Israelites, you see they were defiant before the Almighty God of Heaven. You see many times where uh, they knew who God was. They had seen God work miracles. But yet, you know what they would choose to do? They would forsake the temple. They would forsake the tabernacle. They would go off into the woods and build groves and build altars and build high places.
for the God of Baal, for the God of Ashtoreth, uh, for the God of Molech, all gods with, with, which, my friend, have a little g. Right. They have no power. They have no ability. They were defiant in the face of an almighty God. They said, we are going to worship the creation more than we worship the creator. But, friend, many Christians do the same thing today. How do I know? Because you're not here on Wednesday night because you'd rather work. You're worshiping the creation over the creator. You say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? That, that church should not be optional. The Bible says we should do it even more as we see the day approaching. Amen. Can I say, uh, I saw a picture the other day and it said, uh, it was referring to a, a church member talking to their pastor. They said, Pastor, it's so amazing to see end time prophecy being fulfilled in front of us to see God doing all these things. And then the very next statement was, but we're not going to be here at church Sunday night and Wednesday night. Even uh, uh, much the more as you see the day approaching. We should be looking for chances to be in church and, and to serve God and to do what's right now for less to do. We should be more involved for Christ, not less involved, because we see the day approaching. Church, I believe we could be the last generation before Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. I believe we could be. Now, I also, I, before you come to me, I also understand that Paul believed that. And that was 2,000 years ago. But I say this often. Even if I'm wrong, even if we're not the generation where Jesus Christ comes back, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. Yes. We ought to be busy about his work. We ought to be busy moving on for Christ. Can I say, uh, we look at, we look at the, when, when God was giving Moses the Ten Commandments, what were the children of Israel doing? Making a golden calf. Making a golden calf. They saw God working on this mountaintop, and they said, no, sure, God's killing Moses. Let's do our own thing. Mm -hmm. And they went to a preacher. They went to Aaron, and they said, make us a golden calf. And he said, put all your gold in here. Uh, we're going to make this image for you to worship and do all of these things. Can I tell you, not every preacher online is a preacher you should listen to. Right. Amen. Amen. Uh, the Bible says there's many false prophets today. Yeah. Right. The Bible says there's many false Christs today. Yeah. We must, we must understand that just because someone says the name Jesus in a message does not mean they're of God. Right. Even the devil himself can be transformed into an angel of light. Yes. But church, what we must do, what we must be consumed with is not being defiant to God's will. If something says it in scripture, we ought not say, I know, but. Right. I've heard it before. I know, but my experience. When I'm dealing with, with salvation sometimes, I'm trying to win somebody to Christ, and they say, I know, but then I saw this. I know, but I did this. I know. Your experiences don't matter in salvation. Amen. Jesus Christ versus experience, let me tell you at the end, Jesus Christ takes you to heaven. Experience takes you to hell. Right. Amen. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Now let me tell you, when I got saved, it was an experience. Amen. Being transformed, becoming new. What an amazing day that was when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me. I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. As everyone who's accepted Christ as their Savior has. But friend, experience never outweighs God's word. What do I mean? Well, I saw a 50-foot Jesus, and that's why I'm saved. That's not what the Bible says takes you to heaven. Right. Well, I was put in, I, I, you don't know how I felt when I was baptized. Baptism is just a work. It doesn't take you to heaven. Right. It's a picture of what Jesus Christ has done in your heart. Right. Can I tell you, church, we must, we must not be defined if God's word says it. God's word is right and I am wrong. Amen. If God's word says it, whether you like it or not, it's right and you're wrong. Amen. You want to know how I know? Brother Justin, you've been over the whole universe, haven't you? You, you were there. You were there when the stars were made, weren't you? You you were there when the earth was created, Brother Daryl. Surely you were there when darkness was upon the face of the deep, right? Oh, that's right. You you have all knowledge, don't you? You have all the wisdom. You have all the understanding. You have all the power, right? You have all the power in the world, right, Brother Mike? Oh, that's right. I didn't think so. Can I tell you, there is one that does, and it's the one that gave us this book. Amen. It's the one that cannot lie. Take his word of the bank, ten times out of ten, it's never going to be wrong. There's not an error, there's not a, there, there's not a fallacy, there's not a lie that God has ever told us to take the 
Word of God. Take it to the bank. Friend, we must understand that defiance does not help us in regards to defiance against God. Now, we ought to be defiant against the things of this, this world, the things of the devil. Right. We ought to take a stand against wickedness. Amen. We, ought to, we ought to take a stand even if it means consequences for us. Amen. But I'm speaking specifically in the realm of defiance, knowing what is right to do and refusing to do it. Knowing what you're supposed to do and saying, I'm not. It's wrong. It's wicked. It's sinful. But we see David, David, what was David? David was a directable individual. I don't know if it's a word. If I look at the dictionary tonight and it's not a word, I'm going to copyright it. And then if any time you use it, you're going to owe me a quarter. So uh, you better look it up before I do. Uh, but directable, uh, what, was, what was this? David, even though he was imperfect, even though he was a sinner, even though he messed up, he had a characteristic that was different than the children of Israel. He was able to be guided and directed. He was able, when the word of God came out, he was able to be, to be shown that he was wrong and he was willing for the Holy Spirit to guide him. Many times people are very, very apprehensive to change. Well, I mean, these are the same things that have been here for 50 years. We couldn't reupholster them. There's holes in them and they're, you know, nasty. The carpet, we couldn't replace the carpet. You know, uh, this person don't even owe the money for the carpet, but the carpet's got stains all over it. You say, Pastor, that's silly. I know churches that have split over it. Amen. Doctrine should divide. Preferences should not. I've said that before. But David was a man that was willing to allow, the, to, uh, to allow God to direct his heart. How do I know? Psalms chapter 37, verse 23, the Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Amen. Proverbs 16, 9, the Bible says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in the man to, that walketh to direct his steps. We've already read the first Peter 2, 21. But uh, Psalms 119, verses 133, the Bible says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Us allowing God to lead our life, to direct our steps, will make it a lot harder than if we try to do it on our own. Amen. If we try to do things of our own power and of our own volition, can I tell you, you can have success for God, success for God, in your own power and your own strength. How do I know? The Bible says many will say unto me in that day, Lord William, have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? They did everything in their own power and their own strength without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. You know you can read your Bible and not have a relationship with Christ? Amen. What, how do I, what do I mean? If you've never gotten saved, you don't have a real relationship. Right. And we know the end of the Bible says, Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. Amen. You know what that says? A lack of relationship. Some random person comes up to me on the street and says, Hey, I, I know you. But I, I don't know you. I, I, there's never been a, a real relationship. There's never, there's never been a relationship that's been made. Right? But we must understand that the Lord is the one that, if we allow Him to direct our path, if we take one more step in faith every time we're in darkness, if we take steps based upon what Jesus Christ has told us to do, based upon what His Word tells us to do, you know what? We can make our way through any battle. We can make our way through any darkness. And I see their achievements, thirdly. The Israelites' achievements were dishonorable. If we were to look at the nation of Israel, we can see there were good kings and there were bad kings. Uh, but we can see uh, a pattern that the children of Israel strayed away from God. They disobeyed God and started serving other gods with a little g. But we see the true show of God's love that he kept it. He kept them as his chosen people, even though they messed up and did wrong. It's a perfect comparison about how we, when we mess up and do wrong, God still keeps us. Amen. I'm wicked. My heart left to itself, I know what it is. It's desperately wicked. That's right. But you know what else I know? Is that God loves me still. Amen. When I make mistakes, when I mess up, when I do things that I shouldn't do, God doesn't forsake me and throw me to the curb. That's right. He doesn't say, go. See you later. Have a good day. You know what he does? He directs me. Amen. I know he loves me. Amen. If I have the right attitude, I can be brought right back into that fellowship with God. Amen. Can I say, we look at David's life, and we see he had an honorable life. 
If we look at David's life, we can see that there are sometimes David did the very same thing as the nation of Israel. But we see that God refers to David as a man after God's own heart. He had a relationship with the Lord. He feared the Lord and wanted to live for him. You may say, Pastor, how does this apply to me? How can I apply this to my life? How, how can I make this uh, uh, an impactful thing in my life? I want you to imagine, if you would, a pool. You all seen a pool before? The barns have one at their house. My son, Caleb, you know what he used to do? Many of you, if you were there, saw it too. Caleb would walk up and he would stick his foot in the water. He didn't want to be in the water. Many of you remember that? Ms. Pisani, you remember that? He just put one foot in the water and he said, I want, I want to sit. And he'd sit here on the edge of the pool, and his feet would be in the water. Many times, this is the way we look as Christians. We sit on the edge of the pool, kicking our feet in the water, but that's as deep as we want to get. God doesn't want us sitting on the outside, dabbling in God's will. Right? God wants us in his will. Canaan now, that boy loves the pool. He wants to be the first one in. He wants to jump off the edge. He wants to swim all around. He's figuring out those floaties. Keep him up. So he jumps in and he swims around. He loves being in. Can I tell you? Just jump in. The water's fine, brother. Sister, serving God is fun. It's great. Are there hardships? Well, sure there are. But there's no life like a life lived for Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, sometimes I see people like that, Brother Brennan, and I wish I could just grab them and throw them in the water. You're so close to experiencing the fullness of joy that comes in a life served for Christ. But you sit on the side and you say, I wonder whether it's worth it. I wish I could just push you in. Because it's worth it. But friend, I can't make the decision for you to get involved and serve the Lord. I can't get in, I can't force you to trust him to take the next step in your darkness. I can't, I can't make you do those things. It's something that you must decide to do. To trust him enough to take the next step. How's your attitude? You know, it's important that you do a work for Christ, but he doesn't just care that you do the work. He cares about the attitude in which you do the work as well. This is something in which I, I see most uh, hurting the Christian people of today. They're willing to do things for God, but sometimes it's not with the right attitude. Sometimes it's with an attitude of, I have to do this. I have to serve God. I have to. I have to. I have to. I hate that word. I have to. Because you know the truth is, we get to serve God. I'm not worthy to be even a servant in God's camp. Come on. But he didn't call me just to be a servant. Brother William, you know what happened when he saved me? I became his son. I didn't just, I didn't just become a servant. I became his son. I became royalty. I don't have to. I get to. Many times we have the wrong attitude about it. But I say, we ought, to, we ought to understand that the attitude comes from somewhere. It doesn't just uh, come out of thin air. If parents, if our children have an attitude about serving God, I encourage you to look to whether you have the attitude about serving God. Because the attitude I have to serve God comes from somewhere. What do, we, what do we make an emphasis? A good way for us not to feel like we have to serve God is to make serving God fun. What do I mean? My kids are excited about church on Sunday morning. You know why we're excited? Because we make it a big deal. We make it exciting. We try to make it something to look forward to. So, well, they should go to church because they love God. Bless God. Well, sure they should. But then, let's turn up the flip side. You should never wake up thinking to yourself, man, I don't want to go to church today. Amen. But we do. We, 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 ought to, we ought to be about our attitude, constantly improving our attitude, constantly guarding our attitude, constantly protecting our attitude, making sure it's what we ought to be. How are our actions? Now, do you have a secret? God doesn't need actors. There are plenty of actors. He needs workers. Are we doing what we do to be seen of men, or are we doing what we do because God wants this of us? Are we being defiant in our work? Do we refuse to give God all of us, or do we refuse to give him anything? When the end of our life comes, what will be our achievements? 
Will we have a lot of stuff? Will we be rich? Will we be dishonorable to God? Or will we live a life that says, I'm glad I did? Can I tell you, at the end of your life, you're going to have one of two responses. It's going to be, I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. I can tell you, a life lived for Christ is always better. But living for Christ requires us to take steps. It requires us to continue stepping for him. With Veterans Day here, I, I found a story of a man named Roy P. Benavides. He, was, he served in Vietnam. Uh, in, in, in on, uh, I'll read this report. It says, uh, uh, Master Sergeant Roy P. Benavides, United States Army, who distinguished himself by a series of daring and extremely valorous actions on 2 May 1968, while assigned to detachment B-56, 5th Special Forces Group. First Special Forces Republic of Vietnam, on the morning of 2 May 1968, a 12-man Special Forces Reconnaissance Team was inserted by helicopters in a dense jungle area west of Lac Ninh, west of Lac Ninh, Vietnam, to gather intelligence and information about confirmed large-scale enemy activity. The area was controlled and routinely patrolled by the North Vietnamese Army. After a short period of time on the ground, the team met heavy enemy resistance and requested emergency extraction. Three helicopters attempted extraction, but were unable to land due to the intense enemy small arms fire and anti-aircraft fire. Uh, Sergeant Benavides to the forward operating base in Lac Ninh, monitoring the operation by radio when these helicopters returned to offload wounded crew members and to assess aircraft damage. Sergeant Benavides voluntarily boarded a returning craft to assist in another extraction attempt. Realizing that all the team members were either dead or wounded and unable to move to the pickup zone, he directed the aircraft to a nearby clearing while he jumped from the hovering helicopter and ran approximately 75 meters under withering small arms fire to the crippled men. Prior to reaching the team's position, he was wounded in his right leg, face, and head. Despite these painful injuries, he took charge, repositioning the team members and directing their fire to facilitate the landing of the extraction aircraft and loading of the wounded and dead team members. He then threw smoke canisters to direct aircraft to the team's position. Despite his severe wounds and under intense enemy fire, he carried and dragged half of the wounded team members to their waiting aircrafts. He then provided protective fire by running alongside the aircraft as it moved to, p- to pick up the remaining team members. As the enemy fire intensified, he hurried to recover the body and classified documents on the dead team leader. When he reached the leader's body, Sergeant Benavides was seriously wounded by small arms fire in the abdomen and grenade fragments in his back. At nearly the same moment, the aircraft pilot was mortally wounded and his helicopter crashed. Although in extremely critical condition due to multiple wounds, Sergeant Benavides, uh, Sergeant Benavides secured the classified documents and made his way back to the wreckage where he aided the wounded out of the overturned aircraft and gathered stunned survivors into a defensive perimeter. Under increasing automatic weapons and grenade fire, he moved around the perimeter, distributing water and ammunition to his weary men, reinstilling in them a will to live and fight. Facing a buildup of enemy opposition with the leader team, Sergeant Benavidez mustered his strength, began calling in tactical airstrikes, and directed fire from supporting gunships to suppress the enemy's fire, and so permitted another extraction attempt. He was wounded again in his thigh by small arms fire while administering first aid to a wounded team member just before the extraction helicopter was able to land. His indomitable spirit kept him going as he began to ferry his commander or his comrades to the craft. On his second trip with the wounded, he was attacked by a Vietnamese soldier who he dispatched. His, uh, he then continued under devastating fire to carry the wounded to the helicopter. Upon reaching the aircraft, he spotted and killed two enemy soldiers who were rushing to the craft from an angle that prevented the aircraft door gunners from firing upon them. With little strength remaining, he made one last trip to the perimeter to ensure that all classified material had been collected or destroyed and to bring the remaining wounded. Only then, in extremely serious condition, from numerous wounds and loss of blood, did he allow himself to be pulled into the extraction aircraft. Sergeant Benavidez's gallant choice to join voluntarily with his comrades who were in critical status Uh, Only then, in extremely serious condition from numerous wounds and loss of blood, did he allow himself to be pulled into the extraction aircraft. Sergeant Benavides' gallant choice to join voluntarily his comrades uh, 
who were in critical straits to expose himself to withering enemy fire, and his refusal to be stopped despite numerous severe wounds saved the lives of at least eight men. His fearless personal leadership, tenacious devotion to duty, and extremely valorous actions in the face of overwhelming odds were in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect the utmost credit on him and to the United States Army. This man was wounded, wounded, and wounded again, and he just kept going. Let me ask you, do you think there were times where Sergeant Benavides thought to himself, I should just quit? I can tell you, I get shot the first time, I'm going back to the helicopter. But you know what he did? He kept going. He kept rescuing. He kept serving. He kept fighting. He kept doing whatever it took to make sure the mission was complete. Mm -hmm. Friend, let me ask you a question. What are you doing to make sure the mission is complete? Are you advancing Christ's kingdom? Or are you refusing to step for Christ? Amen. Can I tell you? Along the way of this life, Brother Brendan, you're going to get wounded. This world hates you. Can I let you know? You're going to be attacked. You're going to be distracted. You're going to be distraught. There's going to be times of wounds in your life. But it's not the time to quit. One day you'll be in heaven, and there'll be no more wounds. There'll be no more hardship. There'll be no more difficulty. There'll be no more pain. And there'll be no more death. But friend, today is not that day. I hope. Take another step. If you're in darkness today, you're in a valley today, just take one more step. I'm sure there were times where that sergeant thought to himself, I just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. If I can just make it to one more soldier, if I can just make it to one more man, and one more man, and one more man, and one more man, and before you knew it, he had rescued the whole group, recovered the, recovered the bodies of the soldiers that had fallen around him, the classified documents. But you know what? It required him taking steps. Amen. In this life, Brother Justin, you're going to find wounded Christians laying in the battlefield. And you know what? It may be difficult to try to help them get back to where they ought to be. If you think about it, you may be wounded yourself. But they're worth getting into the helicopter. You may come across, you may come across uh, another wounded guy. And you say, you know what? I'm coming back for you. Let me get this guy over here, but I'm coming back. And you may get wounded again. But let me tell you, friend. Just say, just got to put one more step. Just one more step. You're asking to be just one more soul. You're out soul winning and you're tired. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Just one more soul. For if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every trial. It would be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. Amen. Friend, just take another step. Don't quit on Christ. He's never quit on you. Take the steps to follow him. Every head down, every eye closed. And nobody promised the steps would be easy to take, but they'll be worth it to take. Would there be anyone in the room here today that says, Pastor, I know that I know that I know 100% sure if something was to happen to me and I was to pass away, that I'd go to heaven. Is anyone like that? says, I know that for sure. I see those hands. You can put them down. Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, I am not 100% sure that I'd go to heaven if something happened to me, but Pastor, I want to know that. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that? I see that little hand. I see that little hand as well. I will pray for you in just a minute. Anyone else? Would there be anyone that would say, Pastor, something that you said today, the Lord used to speak to my heart. <coughs> Please pray for me, Pastor. Anyone like that? I see those hands. Hands all over the room. 
Well, let me encourage you. I'm glad to pray for you. But let me encourage you. Take a step. Come to the altar and pray and ask for God to help you continue to take steps in your life. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time you've allowed us to be together. Lord, I pray that you be with each and every one of us, Lord, to just continue to take steps for you. Lord, please help us to continue to follow after you. Please help us to continue to serve you. Please help us to continue to do what we know to do, what we know to do. Lord, I sure love you. And I pray for those little ones that raised their hand that they didn't know for sure heaven was their home. I pray, Lord, that you'd let them get that taken care of. Lord, I sure love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As you as we stand to our feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as the Lord dealt with you, come to you. Thank you. 